next we have Dr. Bill Walton. Um, Dr. Bill Walton is the director of the Auburn University Shellfish Lab located on Dolphin Island, Alabama on the Gulf Coast. He is also an associate professor in Auburn University School of Fisheries, Aquaculture and Aquaculture Sciences and a Marine Extension Specialist for the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. He conducts applied research with local self shellfish farmers, shell fishermen, commercial and recreational, and national and local organizations. Before moving to the Gulf, he did similar work along the coast of Massachusetts, and his interests include all aspects of marine invertebrates, fisheries, restoration, and aquaculture. So we heard a little bit of an introduction from Jason as to how all of your work has helped. So now we're looking forward to hearing from you. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll just jump in. For farmed oysters, I, there are a lot of definitions of farmed, and certainly we use different definitions in the Gulf of Mexico. When I'm talking about farming, I'm talking about off-bottom uh, farming of oysters, and I'll, I'll show you some pictures of that. But, you know, I think one of the things I wanted to emphasize was, um, you know, Jason mentioned he started in 2009, and, and when I started around the same time, uh, we had very little off-bottom, we actually had no off-bottom oyster aquaculture in the Gulf of Mexico at that time. Um, it had been tried uh, earlier and sort of uh, decided that it wasn't viable at the time, um, and it's been revisited. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of that story, and then uh, lead up to thinking about how that might interact with oil spills. Um, I will, I just, this graphic I also just wanted to point out to you that when, when you think about American aquaculture and marine, that uh, shellfish are really the stars. I know a lot of people tend to think of salmon, but if you actually look at the numbers, oysters, clams, uh, mussels, and shrimp make up a tremendous amount of the value of our current marine aquaculture. So shellfish aquaculture in the USA is, is something that's been done in other parts of the country. Um, we, it's actually, I think, what many people think of as sort of the success story for U.S. aquaculture. And, and uh, I, I think it's literally the poster child um, for NOAA's aquaculture program. Often you'll go to their webpage and you'll see shellfish aquaculture there. Um, but as I mentioned, 2008, we had very limited oyster culture in the southern U.S., at least when you think about oyster culture using some type of mesh bag or something where the oysters are kept up off the bottom. What we've done a lot of, and, and Jason primarily, I think, spoke about the wild reefs um, and the management of those, because that sort of falls, that's the primary mission maybe of marine resources. And, and those can be fished with tongs um, in some states or with dredges. But we also have private oyster beds, and, and these can be very productive. And I just want to mention that because that's a big part of the management of our oyster production in the Gulf of Mexico is off of private oyster beds. And so these are privately managed, essentially privately managed fishing grounds. Both of those traditional methods rely on natural set, at least they have up till now. And, and we can talk during the questions, we can talk about whether spat on shell makes sense for public or private sector. Um, I think it's got some really interesting opportunities, but typically what we've done is what Jason described. We've put shell on the bottom and tried to improve the habitat for oyster settlement to improve set. And that has really been premised on that if you, if you build it, they will come. Like if you put shell on the bottom, then you'll catch a set. And I, I think anybody, I, I saw some of the names that, um, that are in this, uh, in the audience and I know on the panel, well, that's not always true. Um, but it has been sort of, it's been one of the driving forces of management um, for oysters uh, traditionally in the Gulf. That does mean that we've had large swings in availability uh, across the Gulf. It also means that we've been primarily a commodity market, that nationally when people think of Gulf of Mexico oysters, they think of a, typically they're thinking of a shucked product um, that's often moved at a higher volume and a lower price. Um, we're, we're really good at producing lots of oysters, or at least we can be. Uh, but, so what is this idea of aquaculture? Well, uh, Auburn Shellfish Lab is just one of these. We opened in 2003. There's a, we have a sister um, uh, institution, LSU's got a wonderful shellfish lab out on uh, Grand Isle, and then there are others um, in Mississippi and Texas and, and Florida. Um, but even a building like this, you, we can spawn over 2 billion oysters per year. Um, I, I know we can raise 42 million two millimeter oyster spat because we've done that, and I think we could do more if we needed to. So the capacity in terms of numbers is large. Um, but what, why is that? Um, 
I just, just again, as Jason said, we don't necessarily know who's in the audience. So just to get everyone on the same page, hatcheries really just reproduce what happens in nature, but we just maximize the survival as we go. So we maximize spawning success. Uh, those, and these are spawning oysters that, that should be more romantic than it looks, but those are spawning oysters. We maximize fertilization. We try to make sure that the larvae are growing well and surviving well. We try to make sure that that metamorphosis um, goes fairly well, and then the early growth or the nursery. We're, again, we're just um, not using chemicals, just really trying to maximize uh, the process. Um, and so these are what we spend a lot of time growing. This is a, a microscopic oyster larvae and they would grow, this is actually at Horn Points facility, uh, but these are larval tanks. And so a tank like this could have tens of millions of larvae in it at any uh, given point. Uh, once they go through metamorphosis, so that microscopic swimming stage uh, swims for about two weeks. And, uh, you know, in Texas, it would be out in, in uh, the bay swimming for about two weeks. And in Alabama and Mississippi, it would swim in the sound for about two weeks. And then it goes to set when that's when it glues down and it becomes seed. The oyster farmer doesn't want the clusters, the spat on shell. The oyster farmer wants this. Um, this oyster farmer happens to be uh, my wife. That's her arm. Um, and this is about 100,000 single oysters. And so those are oysters that we wanted to raise in bags uh, or baskets, uh, not on the bottom, but protected. Um, so very briefly, there's no sound for this. So don't, you don't have to turn up your volume or turn down your volume. Um, this is just showing you what an off bottom oyster farm looks like. This is um, in Portersville Bay, Alabama, but this would be very typical of what you might see for a series of oyster farms. This is a floating cage type system. And in the distance, you'll see over here is an adjustable long line system. And so typically the oysters are growing in bags held just below the surface. Um, and then when you want to dry them off, which I'll talk about in a minute, you can flip those cages up. Um, for the adjustable long line system over here, whoop, uh, you can also um, adjust, it's a little bit like a clothesline that has baskets hanging on it and you can move that, that clothesline with the baskets up and down. Importantly, oyster farming, um, we're really just putting oysters out in the system and this will be important for considering oil spills. We're just putting them out in the system and letting them eat the food that's in the water. So they're relying on the salinity, they're relying on the food and the oxygen that's in that water. And of course, any challenges to that water quality have an impact on the oysters there. So off-bottom oyster aquaculture is different um, in some ways. It, it's relying on hatchery reared seed, although we use the native species. Um, we are using gear and that gear, uh, this plastic basket that you're looking down the length of, helps protect those oyster seed from predators, burial, and, and other losses. Um, these, these oysters grown this way, sprinkled on the bottom, are this and essentially Pringles for crabs and oyster drills. We, we try not to let them spill on the bottom. They are best, they do best if they are kept in the basket. You can imagine this requires time and money. But one of the benefits about this is that means that we can take off-bottom off oyster farms can be established in areas where the bottom would not support oysters living in a natural reef. We've got lots of areas that we have oyster farms um, where you don't see any oysters on the bottom uh, because it's not suitable, but the water column uh, is. So, you know, very briefly, why weren't we doing this? If this is, if this is so great, Bill, why weren't we doing this? Um, and so briefly, we had to deal with some of these things. This is a lot of work and money. So if nature's providing oysters in abundance, why would you do this? What would you do about fouling and overset? That's all the things that want to grow on your oysters in your baskets. Uh, are people regionally willing to pay what it costs to produce these oysters? And then of course, uh, hurricanes and theft and vandalism were some concerns. I'll give you the short answers here. Um, Right now, um, off-bottom oysters can provide a consistently high quality that nature does not. Uh, a bottom-grown oyster can be the most exquisite oyster uh, that you've ever had. It could also sometimes be a little muddy, uh, can be sometimes fairly large. Um, there are a lot of variations in it. The off-bottom farmed oyster lets a farmer essentially handcraft their oysters and produce these uh, high-end oysters that are going for um, high-end markets. Uh, so one, you're not trying to compete with the, with 
the bottom product. You're essentially trying to be the micro brew uh, um, of oysters and, and satisfy different customers. Um, what do we do about fouling and overset? If you're going to grow oysters in the wild, uh, in the wild environment, the natural environment, you're going to get fouling. And essentially, we went and tested different types of gear that are used in different parts of the world. And the answer was nothing fancy. The answer was that air drying, where you control the frequency and the duration of low tide, was the answer to control. Very briefly, the baskets on your left are baskets that are in the drying position. And so those oysters and their baskets have been lifted out of the water for 24 hours so that the baskets dry out. Whereas these oysters, um, normally you can see they're still in the water. Um, the oysters are still able to feed um, and get oxygen. Um, that would be the normal growing position. So uh, essentially there's no power washing, there's no chemicals. You are essentially just deciding uh, when low tide is and how long. Then that led to the question of markets and price. So we had people that were growing these oysters, what could they do? And, you know, we were, 2009, there was sort of this caution that you wouldn't be able to get more than 15 cents per, uh, more per oyster than the wild oysters. Um, and I, I think I should have revised this probably, I think we're closer now to 40 to 70 cents, maybe even 50 to 70 cents per oyster, typically in, in Mississippi and Alabama. Farmed oysters do have a market um, and they tend to be high end markets, which during COVID-19, you are vulnerable to that for sure. But most of these oysters are going off to cities like New Orleans, Atlanta, Houston and whatnot. And I just wanted to show you that um, the, if you can see that menu there, that is a restaurant um, in Atlanta. Those are prices per oysters uh, that might not fly if you live along the Gulf Coast, um, Mobile, Alabama, Pensacola, Florida, uh, Biloxi. Maybe people don't are not willing to pay two to three dollars per oyster, but um, we are fortunate that there are cities, at least when the restaurants are open, there are cities that have populations that so far all the oysters that have been grown along the Gulf Coast uh, off bottom have found markets. Uh, we're looking at strategies uh, and insurance options for hurricanes. Uh, there's always the risk of theft and vandalism. I don't think we've seen major uh, highway robbery, but that's something that we're always trying to keep an eye on. Um, those are some questions that we're going forward. So I, I want to be careful that off bottom oyster farming is not a replacement for the wild. Um, it is not a replacement for on bottom culture. Um, it is something that I would argue can add to what we do. And, and just to show you, from 2008, we had no farming to 2019, where the farm gate in Alabama was $1.5 million with at least 2.4 million oysters harvested. Um, but, you know, a lot of work. There's 34 full time employees and, and so on. It has created, when you think about resilience, um, this has provided another way for people to make a living raising and harvesting oysters on the Gulf Coast. Regionally, and I know I saw Brian Callum was on the call. I, I think last I remember from Brian, there are about five to seven oyster farms in Louisiana. Mississippi's got eight oyster farms with uh, many more about to be established. Florida, it's a little bit harder. It depends how you define a farm because permits and farms are different, but there are at least 75 farms now raising oysters in Florida. And then we've seen uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia all also starting to increase this type of culture. So uh, if you tuned in specifically about oil spills, this is where I, you know, my experience, um, I moved here, started in January 2009. Uh, we started working with I folks with this idea of off-bottom oyster farming. Um, and so we had attempted it in several locations in the 90s. It wasn't considered a viable option. And there was little to no interest before the oil spill. Um, and I'm not suggesting that the oil spill led to the interest because we actually were in the middle of a project with folks at LSU where we had one farm in Alabama and one farm in Louisiana um, that we were working with at the time. So one, one in each state. Um, but then we were closed because of the Deepwater uh, Horizon oil spill. We had concerns about the crop. Would the oysters grow and survive? Um, would people be willing to eat these oysters af after this oil spill? Um, because would they be safe to eat and how would, cons even, if the even if the oysters were safe, um, how would you deal with some of the market challenges? I just want to point out that when I was here, I was on Dauphin Island at the Auburn Shellfish Lab and certainly you remember from the news there was, there was oil washed up on Dauphin Island. There were probably three days that summer where I was at the lab where I could smell a strong smell of oil coming in off of the water. That said, our water quality, we did, we were always concerned about running our 
normally our pumps that would bring in ambient water. So we did go to recirculating system. So we continued production, but the recirculating system for us was not ideal. So um, we tried to struggle through that, um, but it, it was hard. It was very difficult. Um, we reopened in that fall of 2010, and we had no observed effect on growth or survival of our farmed oysters. Um, we went out, we uh, helped the grower uh, with some independent labs uh, doing some testing, and there were no contaminants that approached the level of concern. Many were below levels of detection. That, that sort of surprised us. Um, but, you know, that was the data supported that. Market demand varied. Um, initially, supply was low, um, and growers did not, to my surprise again, growers did not have a problem selling their product. Uh, I worked with Dan Petrolia at Mississippi State, and in a consumer survey, which was a couple years after that, uh, we went to places, um, we went to Texas, uh, we went to Houston, uh, Alabama, and then Chicago. And even in Chicago, um, it was not mentioned, or the oil spill was not mentioned as a concern in our focus groups. That, that really surprised me that by then the, the market had, had moved on. So, you know, are farmed oysters resilient to oil spills? And I'd say, you know, there are a number of risks. Um, our hatchery production is at risk. Most of our hatcheries depend on ambient seawater. And if water quality is degraded, whether it's your hatchery or your farm, because your farm is out in the, in the open system, that can impact your oyster survival and growth. You're vulnerable to your product being contaminated. And of course, um, and this might be the easiest thing to trigger, your consumer demand could drop. That um, everything else could be fine, but if the consumer's perception is that uh, your product could be contaminated, you could see demand for that drop. We've seen that um, with wastewater spills, wastewater spills that are nowhere near a farm because they're in the press that can affect consumer demand. Some of the opportunities though for farmed oysters are you are able to generate a new crop fairly quickly. So typically from the day we spawn an oyster to the day it's harvested in many of the growing areas across the Gulf is a 12 month grow out. I would never wanna lose a crop, but even if I had lost an entire year's crop, I should be able, um, if I can get seed, I should be able to be back um, harvesting fairly soon. Farmed oysters could potentially be transferred to different areas. People sort of like this idea, but I will tell you, we did this for a freshwater event in Mississippi. It is considerable logistical challenges to moving large farms of oysters. Um, not only are there regulatory challenges, but just logistically moving um, a million oysters in gear is um, intimidating. Um, and, I, you know, I don't know if it made people more open to the idea of off-bottom oyster farming, but despite what went with on with the Deepwater Horizon, the off-bottom off -bottom oyster industry actually continued to grow after that. So um, what might have been something that might have been a death knell for the industry actually did not kill it. I don't know that it encouraged it, but it did not, um, it did not kill off the new industry that was started. And with that, um, I know we're going to save questions. So... I'm gonna uh, pass it back to Danny. Fantastic, thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Uh, while you we were talking, we had uh, Marcy jump in and just wanted to mention that there are currently about 200 oyster farmers certified with FDACS. So we've got a good, a good group going on there. 